See, okay, I have found a few things that make me more effective at making music, but if I'm completely honest, I'm not the best at implementing them. Uh, one of those would be, I find that I'm way less distractible and way better at making music consistently and staying focused if I'm not doing something. Hey guys, welcome to the Industry Set Podcast where we interview high caliber artists and discuss all things music marketing, branding, networking, creating opportunities for yourself, production, productivity hacks, and much, much more. That being said, if you are a music producer and you're looking to level up in all these areas, then be sure to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel below so you don't miss out on future episodes. And in today's episode, we interviewed Ace Aura. I've been following Ace Aura's music for a couple of years now, ever since he did that remix of Berserk by Sudden Death. Ever since then, he's still been able to double down on his sound design and keep it fresh and innovating. And so I thought he would be a great person to have on this podcast and to have a discussion about that creativity and how he's still able to make things fresh after so many years of pushing his sound design. And so we cover a lot of ground in that and as well as mindset, creativity, and also how he continues to level up in all areas of production. That being said, I'll see you in the podcast. But just going back to the very start, how did you get into music production? Yeah, so I started music production when I was in eighth grade, I would say. Um, I found out about electronic music through a friend when I was eating lunch in the cafeteria. He showed me Skrillex's remix of Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites. No, Skrillex's remix. Uh, Dirty Phonics's remix of Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites. And from that point on, I was like hooked. Um, basically, I like, started a dubstep station on Pandora. I was listening to dubstep all the time. And then just the way my brain works, I've always liked music. I was in the band program in middle school and high school. And I was like, I'm going to learn how to make this stuff. And so um, I used the, I had a copy of Pro Tools that I got for Christmas for my parents one year that I hadn't really worked with much. And I was just going on YouTube and basically trying to learn electronic music production, which is kind of hard when you, number one, don't even know your own software and nobody uses Pro Tools to make EDM. And so I was trying to like piece together bits and pieces from like other producers and other DAWs mostly and like try to make stuff. And I didn't have any samples. I didn't know what sample packs were. So I was using stock stuff and Pro Tools, which isn't good for electronic music. But I just kind of started and then kept slowly, very slowly learning how to get better and better at it. And then bought Ableton in 2016. And then I think that was like a really big catalyst for learning faster. So Right. Um, it's interesting because I'd say like every single person I've interviewed for this podcast has been something Skrillex related for how they got into TV production. <laughs> I mean, I don't blame them, but... At least yours for the first time was, would you say it was a Dirty Phonics remix of its release? Yes. Uh, yeah. And so what were you doing prior to going full-time with music? Like around around that part that you were just talking about how you were like, you know, getting a, into Ableton for the first time, you just got Ableton. What were you already doing at that time? When I had just gotten Ableton, I was in high school. It was my senior year, I believe, that I got Ableton. And I was finishing up high school. I had pretty good grades. And so I got into a school for like computer science. Uh, I went to UT Dallas, went there for four years, did college. But all the while I was like, I went there because I thought I wanted to do like maybe music as my hobby. And then computer science is my main thing. And then after like my first year of school, I was like, there's no way I want to do this full time. Music <laughs> is the thing I want to do full time. And so I, was in school but was really devoting a lot more of my time and energy to music than i was to school well more energy to music probably more time to school still but um music has always kind of been the thing i've seen as what i want to do primarily and it like didn't really look like that was going to happen up until i think 2019 is when my manager landon signed with me and then in 2020 which is like crazy because i was booked for a tour not booked um it looked like I was going to be going on tour with Ula Sile and Ominous. And then that tour was canceled because COVID hit, like right when the tour was about to start. And that was such a bummer because I thought this would be like my first point to like really go. And I felt like really hopeless. And then uh, my manager got an email from an agent with United Talent Agency. And then we signed on with them. And then that's like the reason I'm able to do this full time. So the timing of that just worked out super well. Another question I had was, in regards to like your big break, because obviously what you're talking about right now is when you're kind of going full time or whatnot. But I remember as a couple of years back from there that the first time I personally heard of your music was when you put out that uh, Sudden Death Berserk remix. 
Oh wow. Okay. And, and so, correct me if I'm wrong. Were you, were you making that in like while you're at, at at like college or something or like? Yeah, I believe I was in school when I made that. It was yeah. 2018, so it would have been I think my either freshman or sophomore year in college. I think based on the time of year, it would have been my freshman year of college when I was working on that. Because I I remember because I had just started playing shows around that time. Right. And of course, playing shows kind of motivates you to make more music so you can right. play new stuff at your gigs and stuff like that. And so I had made that and premiered it for the first time when I was playing it back to back with my friend Millennial Trash, actually. And um, so, also yeah, it would have been producer. in school. Yes, he is, for yeah. sure. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this week's podcast, then be sure to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel below so you don't miss out on future episodes. And as well as the fact that the more subscribers we get, the bigger and better guests we can get as well. And if you're looking to level up your music career, be sure to hit our website link in our description below, and that will take you to a page where you can put in your email, and then we'll send you a bunch of cool stuff, cool resources and tools that will actually help you with getting your music label ready and also getting your brand tour ready. That being said, I'll see you in the podcast. When you were kind of creating that sound, what was the... I guess uh process behind what you were doing was it like did you have an end goal of like what you wanted it to sound like or were you just like kind of experimenting You're like oh shit this sounds really good i'm gonna keep doubling down on that it was very much experimentation uh it's kind of a mix of both so i had always kind of had that vision of having like a chord like bass sound and i've heard a lot of i had heard a lot of people's music at that time um like skrillex kind of had like melodic sections and growly sections and scary monsters and nice sprites and then people kind of did that sort of thing. And I was like, I was always thinking that it would be really cool if like the heavy parts were also like chords, because I had never heard anyone do that before. And so that's kind of what I had been, I guess, subconsciously working toward all these years when I was like learning how to make music. And I just didn't have the tools or the skills to pull it off until around 2018. The first time hearing, I was like, I've actually never heard anything quite like this. So that's when I just went through a rabbit hole of listening to all your tracks at that point. Um, and I'm sure a lot of other people did as well. And so what was one thing that happened in your career that you didn't expect to happen? Like, I'm sure one part was, you know, going full time and actually doing it as a career. But was there anything else that really standed out? It's interesting because it's like there's a lot of things that were both unexpected and expected, if that makes any sense. Because like I had already made up in my mind when I like started producing that that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I didn't know how I would get there, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do and I wouldn't stop working at it. And so a lot of the things that happened, like getting a manager and signing with a booking agency, like they definitely surprised me when they happened and I was super excited. But like, I don't think it ever changed like the expected outcome in my mind, if that makes sense. Uh, but I'm trying to think of another thing, like anything else that was a shift that I didn't expect. Um I'd say the biggest one would be signing with a booking agency. Uh, Cause up until that point, I had just been like making music was my primary thing. And then playing shows just was a thing that happened sometimes that I'd get random bookings for or play local shows. And that is definitely the thing that shifted me going from making music as mostly a hobby to like being a full-time artist. Like that's where most of my income comes from is shows. And so that was definitely the biggest shift. Yeah. And, and I can imagine considering shows was the catalyst for, for your motivation when you were starting out. I can imagine that it was also the catalyst for you to like go even harder later on once you got a booking agent were doing even bigger shows. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, um, it's funny because you always people will always have these goals in their mind. And then every time you reach a goal, there's like a moment where you're like, cool. I did the thing. What's yeah. next? And so, yeah, <laughs> yeah like when I yeah. signed with a booking agency, you just like kind of have to reach higher and higher. You're like, well, I want to headline a tour one day or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And in order to do that, I have to put out more music and play more shows and stuff like that, which is very interesting because when I was making music as a hobby, obviously, none of those things were like in the back of my mind. But when you transition over to making music full time, it's kind of a thing where you have all these other considerations in your mind besides growing as a producer and making something cool, right. which can definitely mess with being creative and making good music. Yeah, definitely. And so going back to earlier, we were talking about like when you started out in production, 
what was the main hurdle you had when you were going through more of a learning phase of just figuring out your sound and, you know, like just the essentials, like, you know, I'm sure that it would have been a, a wide variety of things like mixing, mastering, sound design and whatnot. But was there a specific hurdle that was your biggest bottleneck? I think, yes. Uh, I'm trying to think back. I remember freshman and sophomore year of college was where I felt the most stuck. And I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was mixing. Yeah, and it's interesting because I would watch all these YouTube tutorials on mixing and things like that. And they can only teach you so much is what I've learned. Like you can have all the techniques in the book, but if you haven't taken the time to do a bunch of mixes and train your ear, it's not going to be worth anything. Like the, the valuable part isn't the techniques. It's knowing when to apply them and how to apply them. And so I think just doing it a lot and getting experience, reference mixing, that was a big one too. Um, I think that was the biggest hurdle that took me the longest time to get through. Yeah. And so would you, would you say that in order to get past that, it was just like through getting the reps in and just, you know, referencing a lot. Yep. That's exactly what it was. And like you, it, it's easy to think that there's some like special sauce that you're missing or like something that everyone's doing that you're not, and you just don't know what it is. But over time, when you just keep at it and especially using references, like listening to music a lot music that you respect that you think sounds good and then trying to replicate that eventually it clicks right and so if you could start over your entire production learning journey what would you have done differently would you have would you approach things in a different way or if i had the resources i think yeah. joining a school would have been really good because especially the feedback i think that's the most valuable thing like if i were to get feedback from professionals that have been doing this for a while and know what sounds good and then just apply that you could improve so much faster because a lot of me learning how to produce was just like in the dark i had a few youtube resources in software that i didn't even use and i didn't even like start with the fundamentals or anything i just kind of jumped in and just like did stuff if i had like a step-by-step -step, this is what you should learn first this is what you should learn second then it would have been a lot better and like that goes doubly for someone that doesn't have a background in music. Like I had a background with like a new chord scales, that kind of thing because of band in school. Mm. But if I didn't know any of that, I would have been completely lost. Yeah. I think feedback is really powerful as well for the fact that it opens for somebody who hasn't had that experience and you're learning from professionals, like they're able to pinpoint the bottlenecks that you don't know even exist because your, your ears aren't trained to that caliber yet. Like, you know, obviously there's like certain frequencies you didn't even know were there. Or like, you know, when you're starting out and you don't even know that, oh, what compression actually sounds like in a certain area of your song. And so I think feedback's really good for opening up those those uh, bottlenecks. For sure. Yeah, there's like things, I forgot, there's this like square diagram that I've seen that it's like things that you know, that things that you know you know, things that you know you don't know, things that you don't know that you know, and things that you like don't know that you don't know. And that last one is definitely the most dangerous for someone who's learning. Because like, if you don't know that there's an area of improvement, you can't really improve it intentionally. Right. And that's kind of where I was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good uh, analogy there. And so if you ever struggled with creati creativity when you were starting out, and I'm sure you might do here and there now as well, but how oh, yes. have you ever overcome that uh, block? It's definitely difficult. Like. I'd say I've been in like a soft writer's block for the last couple of years compared to what I was like making before this point. And um, what I've learned is that at least now writer's block manifests itself from pressure. Like it's something that comes as a result of pressure. Like if I'm thinking I need to make the coolest dubstep track known to mankind or people are expecting the most innovative music of all time from me, then I can't make anything like you can't live up to impossible standards like that. You just have to like take a step back, which is way easier said than done. Um, take some time to analyze your mindset. Be like, why am I making music? What is my motivation? What is like holding me back? And usually for me, it's pressure. Um, and then you kind of have to detach yourself from it somehow. And so for me, that could be making something that's not dubstep that I don't feel like I have to release. And so I don't have this like idea in my mind that it has to be good. I just have to make something. And um, exercises like that, or even like 
making edits of tracks to play live. Like uh, if I don't, for, for whatever reason in my mind, playing something live feels different from like releasing it online on all platforms and stuff like that. And so just making something fun to put in a live set will sometimes break me out of that. And so typically I would say, especially for a professional, it would be pressure. I think that aligns perfectly with my next question as well, because what I was going to ask is how do you keep creative now that you're a professional and you know, there's, there's somewhat of an expectation from the music industry um, of how songs might be structured or how they're sounding. Has that expectation affected you at all in your creative, creative process? A lot. And I am still figuring out how to get through it. I think that's like the stage of my career that I'm in right now is figuring out how to like maximize my creativity. It's funny because before it was like, how do I get my technical skills to a point where I can do this like as my career? And then I did it. And then I didn't expect, like I expected I would just continue to get better and better at making music like from a technical standpoint. But now what the roadblock is, is like, how do I get out of my own head and get in a creative mindset that allows me to explore more and create innovative things? And it's really, it's like a catch 22 because you can't force yourself to, because that's pressure and then you can't create anything. And so it's like, I'm figuring out how to like hack my mind or even like balance my life in a way that allows me to create more freely. Um, and of course, this is something I'm still trying to figure out. But kind of like I said before, a big part of that is eliminating pressure and um, just trying to like allow yourself to create freely. Yeah, I actually had a conversation with this with Tynan and he had pretty much the same answer. Of He's at the stage now where he's just trying to get the fun back and actually being creative and not yep. living by that expectation because Obviously, once you reach that that peak that both both of you guys have been at, where you've you know, discovered your sound and your touring and stuff, it's like, what's next? And how do I like keep that fun and creativity back that I had when I first discovered my sound? So it's, right. it's refreshing to hear that you know you guys all have that same perspective. Yeah, it's definitely interesting that Tynan says that because I I kind of see him as one of the more creative people in the music industry already. Just the way he like make stuff in all sorts of different genres. This stuff is always really unique. It's kind of hard to put mm. in a genre sometimes. So it's, it's definitely comforting to hear that he is kind of in the same boat. Yeah, I think the same. I think he, he definitely uh, puts a lot of pressure on himself of having such a high expectation of being like as creative as possible. But yeah, he definitely kills it. We all do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, have a, do you have a process now? Like I know it's... It, um, this goes against like kind of what you were just talking about, but would you say you have a process somewhat formulated to keeping things unique and fresh? A little bit. Um, I think I've gotten better like lately, like super lately as in the last couple of weeks with just like sitting down for a session and not having any preconceived notions of what I want to make. Just like looking through my sample library or like getting down some notes with a basic saw wave. And just like starting to write something and then letting the track just go where it goes. Um, I find that to be the easiest way to write music and not get stuck somewhere or feel like it's not good enough and then stop halfway through or that sort of thing. So that's been really helpful for me. And what I'd also like to talk about a bit is uh, just like more the productivity side. And I guess uh, your a usual approach for like, workflow and starting and finishing trucks. Like, do you jump in with? A specific template is there a certain way that's set up or how you start the track is it melodies first is it the drop first or gotcha well when it comes to starting ideas there's all sorts of different ways i'll do it it's not always the same each time i know producers that start with drums i know producers that always start with melody i know people that always start with the drop for me it's just kind of whatever i have an idea for or whatever like my mind is on i guess like if i'm thinking i want to make a cool melody i'll start with a melody or if I'm like, I want to have like an interesting drum, like an interesting clap or snare sound that I haven't heard before. I'll start with like designing that and then it will turn into making a drum loop and then making a drop and that sort of thing. Or if I'm like sound designing, the sound, the song will like typically start with like a drop. And so it's, it's different every time, which I kind of enjoy. Um, I know there are people whose brain it would work better to have a specific process, but for me, like the reason I enjoy making music is the exploration aspect of it and like stumbling across really cool things you didn't know existed. And so that's kind of what hooks me into production. And so I think it's, that's, it's pretty different every time. Yeah. I think that's a good take of keeping it less systematic. So then you keep that creative 
energy going each time keeping it fresh. So that's a definitely a good take. What would you say are some good workflow tips for not losing focus on music and like staying consistent with you know finishing tracks? I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to say that and then I forgot to say that uh, <laughs> as an answer to the last question. But um, for me, I do have a very specific process actually when it comes to finishing tracks or like working on ideas that have already started. So what I'll do is I'll sit down, like I'll open the project, of course, in Ableton, and then I will close Ableton or like press play on the track, close Ableton. So I'm not looking at the arrangement view. It just sounds like I'm listening to the song. I will have notes open on like Trello or something where I can make a checklist. Trello is like an organization tool. Yeah, I love Trello. Um, yeah. And I'll like make a checklist of everything I'd like to change with the track as I listen through it. So if I hear something and I'm like, this is a little bit too loud or like this melody needs to change or this like section needs some more background stuff, I'll write those things down. And then I'll also like make a checklist of what sections need to be added, which could be harmful if you're trying to make something that's not really in the box as far as like arrangement goes. But uh, I'll make a list of like what needs to be done basically. And then I'll just finish what's on that list. That typically stops me from chickening out of doing certain sections of the song. For example, I hate making buildups. It is the hardest thing <laughs> in making dubstep ever. And um, if I write on the list that I need to like finish the buildup or like fill it up more than I can't avoid it, I just do it. And uh, I think having a list is really helpful for getting a song like actually finished. Yeah, I, I live by my Trello list, so I'm all about those <laughs> those tips for sure. So do you have any other productivity hacks that you live by? Like, let's say, you know, saying you're using a list, but would you say you use any other productivity things that keep you um, producing music more effectively and consistently? See, okay, I have found a few things that make me more effective at making music, but if I'm completely honest, I'm not the best at implementing them. Uh, one of those would be I find that I'm way less distractible and way better at making music consistently and staying focused. If I'm not doing something that requires a lot of focus earlier in the day, that's kind of hard to describe. I'll give an example. Like if I'm playing video games earlier in the day, I find it really hard to switch from like playing games to making music. Like there's that kind of like attention residue from the 100%. other thing. Yeah. And so it makes it easier if I'm like, okay, the first thing I'm going to do today that requires like serious focus is making music. And then usually doesn't end up bad. But if I start the day by like playing video games or like watching YouTube videos or like anything that I guess it isn't even a focus thing, anything that produces a lot of dopamine. Yeah. Um, giving without it, giving much it too effort. easy. Yeah. If you get, you get yeah. Do something that's too easy for that fixation of dopamine, then everything else just becomes like, why even bother? Way too hard. Yeah. Yeah. So that sort of thing. Um, but if I work out, that's different because that requires effort. You get endorphins, that sort of thing. That's really good to do before a session. But I wouldn't do things like um, spending a lot of time on social media, watching YouTube, gaming before a session. Yeah. Um, that thing, it makes it a lot harder to sit down and make music after you do that. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, my take would be anybody listening, do not get Elden Ring because it will destroy your um, productivity for weeks. <laughs> Interesting that you note that. I was thinking about getting it very recently. Oh, dude, it's like, <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> I usually I usually spend like 200 hours just on the first playthrough. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I and I got it during COVID, so I was just fully delusional while. Okay, so you've got the time. I, I, oh yeah, I was I was delusional from COVID though. Like I felt like I was in the game. It was great. It was super. Oh, amazing. like when you had COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I just woke up, played Elden Ring, went back to sleep, basically. It was great. Best time of my life. That's crazy. Yeah. And all your dreams would make you feel like you're still in that world. Oh, yeah, I was. I was. Yeah. I still <laughs> thought I was like staggering and like dodging things in my sleep. Yeah. That's how I got so good at the Very game. interesting yeah. experience. <laughs> and so going back to some of these questions here, what production sound design or DJing advice would you give to any up and coming producers that? Um, that were just starting out. Hmm. Very open ended, trying to think. So maybe as far as DJing advice goes, don't get too caught up in local DJ politics. 
Uh, there's a lot that'll go on behind the scenes of like who gets to play shows, who gets certain slots. That's just business. Don't take it too personally. The faster you get that, the less hurt you'll be, the more happy you'll be. Um, and if you're trying to do this as your full time job anyway, don't limit your mindset to that. Like, don't think about yourself as a local DJ. You're going to be above that point at some point. It's not going to be there forever. It's like a temporary thing. And so keep focusing on making music because that's typically what brings people to the next level in their career, not DJing. And so making really good music, improving your craft and yeah, just keep doing that and you'll get to where you need to be. Yeah. I think a lot of people have the misconception that if they just take a high volume of local bookings that they'll eventually get to higher places. But I also like how that works. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, is that here in Perth, there's a very limited amount of shows. So when I was starting out, I did the whole local DJ thing and I learned fast that you get pigeonholed very easily as that artist, like, or you yep. know, support guy. And you don't want to do that. So you have to take a step back to take a step forward, kind of like what you were saying. Um, For sure. I think that's great yes. advice. Also wanted to ask you, what are your top five plugins that you're using at the moment? I'm guessing like external, like not stock. Yeah, yeah. Okay. At the moment, top five. Ooh, that's tough. Pitch map. Gotta be number one. As soon as that became popular, I bought it and it's like I don't know. It's like my number one sound design tool at this point. And I think there's a lot that you can do with it that people don't realize because from what I've heard when people use pitch map, they use it in a very specific way where they're like tweaking literally like one knob to make their whole sound. But if you really dive into it and look at the MIDI modes it has and like read the manual and see what all the different knobs do, you'll get a lot more out of it than I think most people will. So that's got to be number one. Two, I hate it, but it's probably Soothe. <laughs> I got Soothe the last year and it has changed my production. Like It's made things so much faster. Whenever there would be like an annoying ringy frequency, I'd have to pull out an EQ, find it, notch it out just enough to where it doesn't feel too empty, but like not too little to where it's still yeah. there. But with Soothe, you just slap it on there. You kind of move what frequency it's targeting and you're done. And that's a little bit scary that I have the power to do that with the plugin, but because I don't want to rely on it too much as a crutch, but it's super helpful. Um, three, four, and five. Let's see. I don't use a ton of external plugins. Oh, Serum. Duh. Serum's got to be a big one. Uh, I also really like Phase Plant. I don't use it a lot, but in those situations where it shines, it really shines. Like, for example, I recently changed my default template uh, to have a sub that's made in Phase Plant because there's a new feature in Phase Plant, I think, with one of the latest updates called LFO Table. And it's like, an LFO wavetable, basically. You've got different shapes that you can kind of morph through in your LFO. And so I put that on my sub so that if I want my sub to wobble a certain way, I can just like change that or turn it off completely and it doesn't wobble. And so like it's a really nice productivity. Mm. Like you, you get things done faster that way. And so I did that. Uh, let's see what else. <sighs> Shaper box. Is how oh, I yeah. use that's how I do side chaining. And so uh volume shaper is something I would not want to live without, but probably could if I had to. And I gotta think of a last one, a fifth one. Ah, uh my master is literally just a plugin called Clip Shifter. It's literally just a soft clipper. And so I probably could just use any other soft clipper. But I like the way clip shifter sounds. All you have to do is like change the input gain. And it'll make the song louder or quieter. But it's not completely crushing everything. It's not a hard clip. And it's not compressing at all. So it's not mm. pumping. It's just making things louder. And I think it's really transparent. So going, actually, that's a good question I'd love to ask you about uh, clipping. Because I had a student in, in one of our programs and he was I was trying to explain to him the difference between hard clipping and soft clipping. Mm -hmm. And um, I was he was struggling to still understand the concept entirely. So I was curious if you had maybe a better way of explaining the difference between, you know, using a limiter versus using a soft clipper. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. So the reason I soft clip over limiting is because when you're limiting, like you're in the time domain a lot more. 
there's going to be an attack time, which is how long it takes for the limiter to react, or release time, which is how long it takes to let go after you've compressed the track a little bit. With a soft clipper, none of that time-based stuff is active. Or I guess technically it is on like a super tiny level, like on a sample-based level. But you're literally just taking the song and making it louder. And if you look at a soft clipper curve versus a hard clipper, hard clipping, there is a point where things just distort. On a soft clipper, it's like a, a soft knee, like if you were to look at a compressor, where like there's a very gradual point where it's kind of cutting it off, but not really. And it, it's like similar to if you were to use a compressor with instant attack and instant release with a soft knee. And so I think that sound, at least for the type of music I make, is more transparent than a limiter is. Um, there are some really good limiters that I haven't tried out. Um, I've heard Pro L is amazing. I know Skrillex uses that, but that's just not a part of my workflow. I haven't tried it out. I just prefer the sound of soft clipping for now. Definitely. I, I noticed the moment I moved from using a hard limiter to using soft clipping that my mixing just became instantly easier as opposed to just trying to fit everything into one limit at the end. Right. <laughs> Something else you mentioned previously was how you said uh, with PitchMap, the plugin, that you have read the manual. So is that something that you often do when you're exploring a new plugin that you'll deep dive into the manual to learn more about it? Yep. That's one of the first things they do, actually. And it's kind of funny how that actually happened. I remember when I was learning production in like 2014, 15, probably, I'd say, um, I saw a tweet from Must Die urging people to read the manual for Massive. And I was like, why would I do that? And then I did. And I was like, oh, there's so many cool features here that like I didn't know existed. Or like, oh, that's what the feedback knob does. And so kind of from that point, and I guess more recently than in the past, Whenever I get a new plugin and I'm trying to mess around with it, one of the first things I'll do is read the manual so I know what every knob does. And that'll typically give me ideas for how to apply the plugin. And so, for example, with pitch map, I feel like what most people do is they'll like set the scale and then they'll just turn up the purify knob so everything sounds like a laser. And I don't think that's the best way to use it. I think in pitch map, um, the feel knob, if you turn that up a little bit, basically it allows more deviations from the notes. And so it's almost as if you were to like detune a saw wave. And so you get like less of a like harsh lasery sound and more of like a softer like synth sound almost. And um, it kind of allows it to breathe more. Not everything is like perfect, perfectly tuned to a note. It allows more like variation there. And the MIDI mode, instead of like setting it to where every note is mapped to a particular note 100% of the time, if you use the MIDI modes and like draw in your own chords, you can change what it's doing over time. And I've done that with like even vocal samples and gotten really cool like bass-like sounds. It's really cool. That's interesting. I think the whole reading the manual thing is is actually really good advice. And I think more people should definitely do that. And that's something I'm guilty of not doing as well. Is like when I first picked up Ableton, that should have been the first thing I did was actually just read the manual because there actually is a lot of good stuff in there. But yeah. that being said, do you do you read any other production books that um that have helped maybe like theory or just sound design or anything like that? Honestly, no. Um, not when it comes to music production. I've read some books when it comes to like productivity and stuff. Uh, I'm trying to remember the names of them because it's been so long. I could literally look in my closet real fast if I wanted to and like check, but I, I don't typically read books when it comes to music production stuff yeah. or sound design. It's mostly experimental and like experience based. Yeah. Would you say your learning process is more just like tutorials and like reading manuals? Yeah, I'd say so. I think the actually the most valuable part of my learning process is just experimentation, mm. like uh, just messing with stuff. And then I'll stumble across cool ways to apply it that eventually just become a part of my workflow. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's some solid advice as well. And so to uh, finish out the podcast, what can people expect from you for this year? I was going to say next year, but we're already in the next year. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, well, I'd say look out for more shows. That, that's all I'll say on that. Um, an EP in the recent future. When is this coming out? 
Wait, when is this episode coming out? Oh, this episode. I thought you were uh, yeah. uh, asking yourself when your EP <laughs> was coming out. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Uh, probably like in uh, the next couple of days. Okay, cool. Yeah. Then, yeah, uh, new music later this month. That's all I'll say on that for now. And just a lot of probably things that are more different from my usual stuff than you would expect as far as oh. releases go. Yeah, I've been experimenting a lot with different sounds, and I think I'm stumbling across like a few really interesting combinations of genres that I haven't really gotten the chance to put out or test at all. But who knows if it'll even come out yet? We'll see. (laughs) Awesome. Thanks for joining me here today. This was a really good podcast, and I think we covered a lot of good ground in terms of like productivity and as well as like your approach to, um, creativity and how you've overcome came that in a really uh unique fresh way i think that's going to give a lot of people a good sense of motivation that even somebody who's a professional has you know came through all these hurdles and actually overcome them over and over again so i think this is just going to be a really good wholesome overall podcast i'm glad yeah it was good talking to you jackson